Praise God. All right, last week we began ministering on the subject of the precious blood of Christ. And uh, we're, we're ministering, so we did last Sunday morning, last Sunday night, talking about the different things that the blood does for us. We're going to fat wrap that up this morning, and we're going to get into uh, the last two points. But let's go ahead and read our foundation text, recover real briefly our other points, and then we'll get into finishing it up. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 through 19 says, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust and your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That, that's, in the King James Bible, the word conversation was Elizabethan manner of life or lifestyle, how you lived. You know, so see, be ye holy in, in how you live. Everybody say, be holy in how I live. Why? Because God's holy. Amen. And if you call on the Father, who without respect to person judges every man according to uh, to every man's judges according to every man's work past the time of your sojourning here in fear now he's not talking about being afraid walk around scared of a rattlesnake you know he's talking about walking around in an awe and a, a reverential awe of, of displeasing God we don't want to displease God amen. amen I'll tell you you know your love for God should won't cause you to not want to displease him yeah. if you love your spouse you don't want to displease right. them yeah. isn't that right if you really say, you know, people say, well, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's bondage, that's works, that's, no, it's not works. If you really love God, you're going to have a desire not to displease him. Hello? I don't get this idea that, you know, that because God loves me, I can do any stinking thing I want to do, and it's okay because I'm under his grace. You know, well, yeah, he loves you, but do you love him? Remember, Jesus asked Peter one time, uh, he, that's what happens when I start. I said, we run off on a rabbit trail, you know, chase some rabbit somewhere. Hallelujah. But you know, Jesus looked at Peter one day and said, you know, as he's kind of nearing, getting ready to go back up to heaven, and said, um, Simon Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, I, you know I love you, Lord. He said, well, then feed my sheep. Now, wait a second now. He, he, Jesus basically said this, that the expression of your love for me is to do something I want you to do. Yeah. Sitting around saying, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To worship you, oh, my soul rejoice. Now, that's good. But I'm going to tell you something. It's going to take more than singing about you loving the Lord. He told Peter, well, Peter said, well, yeah, I love you, Lord. He said, well, then feed my sheep. And then he turned around and asked him, Simon Peter, love us thou me? Well, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. He said, well, then feed my sheep. And he asked him a third time. Peter got upset. And then the Lord began to talk to Peter about the fact how he would die. He would stretch forth his hands. He would be crucified, just like he would be. And Peter didn't like that, so he said, well, what about him? <laughs> what about John? He said, what is it to you that if I want him to live until I come back, you do what I told you to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, and then, you know, I, I knew somebody who actually believed that John was still alive somewhere on the earth because of that yeah, but it came right in the Bible right behind it, and some believe said that, you know, that he, would never, he would not die until Jesus came back, but, you know, he even discredited that belief right in the Bible, right after it was said. Here's the point. If you love the Lord, you're going to do his will. You're going to walk in his will. You're going to have a lifestyle you don't displease God. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I know there's people that are preaching, and they're on television, and everybody just loves it and buys the books and think, oh, it's the greatest thing in the world. I can do whatever I want to because I'm under grace. Uh, no, if you love the Lord, you won't want to displease him. You'll want to conduct yourself in a way that honors him and represents him. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Amen. If your children love you, they're, they're, they're not going to want to go out and live in a way that displeases or dishonors you as, a, as their parents. Yeah. And if they love their self when they love you, they'll do that. I can do whatever I want to. Well, they, they, you love yourself when you love your parents. That was a, such enthusiasm when I said that. Yeah, that's right, preacher. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Okay. And so if you call on the Father who without respect to persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Say, I was not. Didn't say you were. It says, I was. You were not redeemed with corruptible things. Amen. As silver and gold. Now think about that now. We put so much weight and value on silver and gold, and God called those corruptible. Wow. I said God called it corruptible. Are you here? But what were you redeemed with? 
He says, For as much as you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain lifestyle, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Hallelujah. So the blood of Jesus is precious. Webster's defines precious as highly valuable, costly, highly esteemed, cherished, and beloved. So we were not redeemed with silver and gold. You couldn't buy us back. You, could, you know, we did experience substitution. If you'll, you'll stay that out, the importance of the blood we, was substitution. Jesus became what we were so we could become what he is. We covered that last week. Go back and listen to last week's sermon. Hallelujah. We talked about how Mosaic offerings had voluntary, involuntary offerings, but the involuntary required blood. Sin offering and trespass offering required blood. The precious blood of Christ. So we started talking about last Sunday, and then Sunday night we got into what the precious, highly, costly, valuable blood of Jesus has done for us. Number one, it had us justified or declared righteous. Hallelujah. Thank God we've been declared righteous by the blood of Jesus. Amen. We've been justified. Remember the old saying, just as if I'd never sinned. Hallelujah. Praise God. We've been justified or declared righteous by his blood. We have redemption through his blood. You were not atoned for Now, under the old covenant, everybody say old covenant. Old covenant. They experienced the term or the, or the theological statement or, or, or uh, pers uh, perspective of atonement, meaning you were covered. Yeah. But how many knows the difference between covering and starting over? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody ever painted on old, old top of old paint? Now, you get an old house that's got, like, lead-based paint on it. You try to paint over that stuff, and you'll go look at it, and it's all bumpy, and it's got cracks, and it's got all this. I don't care how much you paint it, it's still there. Get a new, fresh coat of paint on it, and it's still there. The only way to fix it is, is to sand it down to nothing, or in many cases, because it's so... Anybody ever tried to get that stuff off? No. Enough to make a preacher... No, anyway. <laughs> Not really, but I'm just, I was just saying that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. I'm telling you, you know, sometimes you just have to tear it off and start over. Amen? And see, Jesus didn't cover you. Yeah, right. See, when you just cover up the old stuff, it's still under there. Amen. The other stuff's still there. It's just been covered. Um, I remember the, uh, the house that Jamie and I, when we first got married, her dad, mom and dad owned a home. It was, old, it was a house built in 1907, Victorian style. Um, and, you know, he bought it for like $7,000 or something, you know. And it was just it was in a part of town that was just the property values weren't there. And, you know, but when he, got, when he got done fixing it back up, it was, it was worth a lot more money. But, uh, I mean, it was the, the, the handrails going upstairs. Well, I'm sorry. They divided into two apartments. They had two separate entrances. We had, so Janie and I, when we first got married, we moved into the upstairs apartment. Well, we, uh, you, you hit the handrails, and they were like shiny, shiny paint, you know, that heavy-duty uh, lead-based paint, you know, oil-based. You know, and you hit and you chip the thing off, and there'd be five different colors of paint down through the layers that got chipped off. I mean, there was so much paint on there, you couldn't, you, you couldn't even feel the wood because it was all paint, just, just layers and layers of paint. Well, that was built in 1907. We got moved in there in 1981, so it was 74 years old when we moved into it. It had 74 years worth of paint put on those handrails. And it's like a lot of Christians think God, see, under the old covenant, that's what happened every year. Every year, they just got the sin covered over again. If you peeled off all the layers, they were still there. I said, they were still there. They just got covered over for a year with the blood of bulls and of goats. But hallelujah, under Jesus, the Bible says he entered in once and for all to obtain an eternal, not atonement, not a covering, but a redemption. We were brought back out of the bondage of sin. We were delivered from the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Somebody say glory. glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. What happened? When that happened, all, when we talk about this, how the Bible says that he took the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and nailed it to his cross. He took all that that was, that was covered up, uncovered it, gathered it up, and took it and nailed it to the cross. Hallelujah. And taking it out of the way at his cross. Glory to God. Washed it away with his blood. Thank God. We're redeemed. We're not atoned for. We are redeemed. Say, I'm redeemed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Not only that, we got forgiveness through his blood. That means as a believer, when you, if you sin after you're saved, the Bible says, if any man sin, he's talking to Christians. You read James. When James was written, it was written to the church. When John was written, it was written to the church. When Peter was written, it was written to the church. So John sent First John. He said, if any man sin, we have what? We have an advocate with the Father. Amen. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. First John, chapter 1. Verse 9. 
Yeah, people say, I don't believe First John 1 now is written to the church. My God, I'm glad it was written to the church. You know? You got, you got people running around saying, well, you don't need to confess your sin. Yes, you do. You got to get it out of the way. And see, the Bible, get, not only did Jesus redeem us out of sin, if you sin after you become a Christian, we, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that if you mess up this week, you don't have to go to hell? <laughs> Amen. What do I do to get that right? Just ask God to forgive you, and he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness with what? The blood of Jesus. Oh, thank God for the blood. There's forgiveness in the blood. Say, thank God there's forgiveness in the blood. Hallelujah. And then our conscience is purged by his blood. Now, now listen, I, I grew up, you know, I grew up classical Pentecostal. And um, I'm going to tell you something. You know, we, we would we, we'd get around, we'd just get to whining about what we'd done wrong. We would. Oh, I, you know, you talk about how you were drunk and you were a pimp and you were a prostitute. I mean, whatever it was you did, you, drugs, smoke, I mean, smoke, dope. I mean, whatever it was you were doing, we'd sit around and have testimony and cry about what we were. And you know, I'm an old sinner saved by grace and this wine and ball and squall. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You know, I mean, just get in there with Chris Christopherson and start singing, Why Me, Lord? Some of y'all never heard that song. Don't go look it up on YouTube. Anyway, you don't want that in your head. Okay? You know, we just, we say, oh, we talk about how bad it was, how tough, I mean, this God was just, he saved me out of my, you know, just, just, just whine. Just whine. But the Bible says, if the blood of bulls and of goats and the sprinkling of the ash of a heifer sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, whoo, thank God for the, that, that was that covering for a year, how much more? See, blood, Jesus' blood is more powerful than the blood of bulls and of goats. The blood of Jesus has more authority than the blood of bulls and goats. The blood of Jesus does more than anything that the world can offer can do. He said, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Why? Because it completely removed the sin from your life. Everybody say glory to God. Oh, thank God we're not just covered, we're, we're, we're redeemed, and our conscience is purged. You don't have to sit around and think about it anymore. Well, I used to do such and such. All right. Hey, I remember you, Eddie, taking on your seat, and the folks went down to Greenville, uh, the Tuckers went down to Greenville, picked up the corn sticks of the cottonseed oil for us. So we could, now listen, the uncooked down there, we, we fry them here. But they picked them up and went to the restaurant. And they said, I'm here to get, my, to get the, the corn. Oh, you're here to pick up the stuff from Eddie Taylor. See, those folks remember me as Eddie Taylor. All right? And, and they remember some of the stuff I used to do. Okay? But you see, the man who did the stuff they remember has been born again. His conscience has been purged from Dead works to serve the living God. He doesn't exist anymore. I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. The man who used to do that doesn't let live anymore. I'm a different man. If you're born again, you're a different man or a different woman. Hallelujah. Amen? You're a different, you're a different human being. And so your conscience gets cleared. You don't need to sit around and rehearse about how bad, you, how bad you feel about what you used to do. I mean, think about what Paul said. I remember who Paul is. Before Paul was Paul, Paul was Saul. And the first martyr of the church, Stephen, when they stoned him to death, there was a young Pharisee standing there holding the coats and cloaks of the men who were stoning Stephen to death and had, was consenting, the Bible says, he was consenting unto his death. A young man named Saul. And he so enjoyed what he saw, them zealous Jews killing those uh, heretical Christians that he went out and began to get letters from the, the chief priest and started going out and trying to find any Christian in that way so he could take them to Rome and, I mean, or to Jerusalem and have them killed because they were heretics. But on the Damascus Road, he had an encounter with the Most High God. Jesus showed up. Now let me say something. That ought to encourage you. If they is messing with you, the Lord is going to show up on your behalf. Are you here? 
You just, he, yeah, the, he showed up, and what's he say? The, he knocked him off the horse and saw a, 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 a light brighter than the noonday sun and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul! Mm-hmm. He didn't say, why are you persecuting the church? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he said this. He let him know. They, they, this is, this is kind of keen, Jimmy. It's hard for you to get kicked against the pricks. You know what he's really saying? Boy, you're in a heap of trouble. Because you've been messing with me. And I have come to stop the messing. Now, Paul, or Saul at the time, didn't take him long to figure out what to do. Who art thou? What's the next word? Lord? Well, didn't Paul write later and say, if you believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it didn't take you long, did it? Nope. Uh, Lord! <laughs> I'm looking at you, so I know you've been raised from the dead. <laughs> Amen? Mm-hmm. He said, now you go into such a city, find this person, you know. Uh, you know and, I'm sorry, I got the story mixed up. He said, um, he told him he's going he's to show him what great things he had to suffer for his name's sake. He had, to, he had to go on and follow and fulfill his, I've chosen him, pulled him out. But see, he came to stop. I'm, I'm telling you, Saul that day, if he had not committed to the Lord, he'd been dead. Mm-hmm. Yep. We would have had the story about Saul that the Lord took out. <laughs> he did, it, was, it was not, this was not a social visit. Now, this is Saul, holding the, holding the clothes to the man who had the first martyr in the church, cons- wanted to kill Christians. But later, Paul writes, after, you know, who, who saw who was later in Paul, the Bible says this. Paul wrote in one place, he said this. He said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. How could you, how could you forget? Why don't you live in, oh, you know, complete and total shame that you helped kill the first martyr of the church? How could you not, you know, feel guilty about bringing Christians bound to be tried for being heretics because his conscience had been purged from dead works to serve the living God? And he said, this one thing I do. I forget those things which are behind, and I press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. The only way you can forget those things which are behind is to have your conscience purged by the blood. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Now, let's move into the next one. This, uh, this, is, this is where we're picking up from last week. I took 15 minutes to recover. Uh, the chicken is going to be there when we get done. All right? Don't worry about it. Hallelujah. We have a new covenant in his blood. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. We're, they're, they're receiving the Lord's table. The Bible says, and after the same manner, he took also the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament, or new covenant in my blood. Do you, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus said there was a new covenant. Hallelujah. Look over in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. That's where we're going next. Chapter, and we're going to read a bunch. 1 through 23. Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 1 through 23. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So the Old Testament law, they could not make the comers perfect. For then they would not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. In other words, you would have to keep coming back year after year after year to get the old stuff taken care of. Once you got taken care of, it was taken care of. Amen. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away the sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now, just talking about Jesus said he came to do thy will, O God. What's wrong with Christians? Who don't think they have to do the will of God? Hello? I don't know. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin that thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure in them which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. O God, he take, listen. Now he said this. This is what he's saying. He said the reason that was said is this. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. 
we are no longer bound. Now understand this. There are different covenants in the Bible. We have the Old Testament. We call, we call the whole Old Testament the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. But you understand this. See, there was, a, there was a covenant made with Adam. There was a covenant made with Moses. Are you here? There's, and there's other covenants. There's a covenant between Jonathan and David. Different covenants throughout the Old Testament. There's the Levitical law, which is under the Mosaic covenant. There's the Abrahamic covenant. What Jesus did was, was, was to the, the, uh, the fulfillment and the, and the completing of the Abrahamic covenant. He fulfilled all that the Mosaic covenant demanded. Now remember, if you'll read, and th- read your Bible, you'll find that the Bible says this about the covenant with Abraham, that the law was made 430 years later. The law was not part of the Abrahamic covenant. The Levitical law was added because they weren't living right and they weren't doing right, and so they had to hold things together long enough to get Jesus here. Because they couldn't, they couldn't live up to the dictates and demands of a holy God in the power of their flesh. And you never will be able to. It's going to take, it's going to take the, the grace of God, the strengthening grace and the empowering grace of God working in you to empower you to be able to live the way you should live. But you've got to trust in that and not sit around and go, I can do anything I want to. That's the wrong, that's not grace. Everybody says that's stupid. That's what it is, it's stupid. It's not grace. Grace is not I can do anything I want to. Grace is God demands this, and when I trust him working in me, he empowers me to live that way. And I, so I, make, I, I go that direction to live that way, and his, his anointing is on me to do that. Not sit down and do whatever you want to do. Go, well, I'm under grace. It don't matter. That's, 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 that's just the devil. Everybody say, that's the devil. Hallelujah. Then they met, so uh, he said, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which we will, we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which never take away sins, what they covered them. But this man... After he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness for us. After that he, made, he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with him after those days, saith the Lord. Now here's, oh, thank God. Yeah. I am glad. Now, this, you know, I, I, I think the Ten Commandments are good, good moral law in the natural. Mm-hmm. But we live as a Christian the laws that we live under should be fulfilling the Ten Commandments and everything else. I, don't think, it's, I, think, I think it's good to have moral law in the schools. Yeah. I think it's good to have moral law. It's God's moral law. Amen? Yeah. All right. He said, this is the covenant that I'll make with verse 16. With them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds without right. And he didn't say he's going to do away with them. He's going to put them in their heart and their mind. Hello? He's going to write them on their hearts and, on their, and in their minds. Yeah. He didn't say he's going to, you, you don't got to have any. He's going to be written in your heart and in your mind. Well, in other words, what? They're going to be in your spirit and in your thinking. You're going to want, you, know, you don't have to have somebody write out, thou shalt not commit adultery. Your heart's going to be telling you, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah, you'll know, right. Thou shalt not cover that neighbor's wife. You don't have to have it written on stone. God wrote it in your heart Amen. when you got born again. Oh, come on, pastor. People don't think, oh, listen, I had some, <clears throat> we had some uh, uh, guy come to a pastor that we know of and, and sit down with his girlfriend and want couple counseling. And when finally after about 10 minutes, the pastor said, I think I know your problem. You're living together in fornication. And the guy went, that's okay, pastor. We're under grace. That don't matter. <laughs> well. Really? Anyway. I don't want to just come in and sit in his office and shoot up. Hey, we're shooting up, Pastor. I think I know why you're having physical problems because you're shooting up. No, I'm under grace. That don't matter. Yes, it does. All right. See, God wrote his law in our hearts and our minds. When you're born again, the law of God is written in your heart. Can you, are you ready for this one? You shouldn't need a preacher to tell you not to do certain things. If our heart condemns us not, then we have weak confidence. If you're born again, your heart will condemn you when you're doing things you shouldn't do. Yeah, right, right. This is the new covenant. 
Thank God that the Spirit of God, the laws written in our hearts, are a guide and a governor that say, no, don't do that. You serve a holy God. Hello? You don't have to have, we, we shouldn't have to even say it in church, but we do. Why? Because you've got preachers going around telling people they can do whatever they want to do. And your flesh will gravitate to the thing that's more fun. You know it. The flesh is the flesh. You've got to kill it. Not kill it physically. but You've got to keep it under. All right, so he's going to write his law in our hearts and our minds. Hallelujah. I'm trying to find out where. Oh, yeah. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. And, there, and, and where remission of sin is, there is no more offering for sin. Now, see, Jesus doesn't have to keep going back. Having, therefore, brethren, in boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We are just singing about this morning. By a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is, to say, through his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. We have a new covenant. We have a new covenant with God that is not a covenant, hello, where you, know, you, you, keep, you keep a tally sheet of what you're doing wrong, what you're not doing wrong, and see if you measure up. We have a God that lives in us. We have a new and a better covenant established on better promises. Aren't you glad we got better promises? How many are glad we got better promises? I'm, listen, I'm telling you something. <clears throat> you know, the, the scripture says God has made us a king, made his kings and priests unto our God. Y'all know that scripture? You know? We made unto our God kings and priests. The Greek really says he's made us a kingdom of priests. Y'all can find that if you want to, kings and priests. God made us a king. I don't have to go get somebody to go before God for me. Are you here? Yeah. Why? Jesus is who I go to. I am a priest. I don't have to say, say this. So Revelation 5, 10, he's made us unto our God kings and priests. We shall reign on the earth. The Greek literally says we made us a kingdom, a kingdom of priests. Why? Because the priesthood is now the people of God. We all serve in the holy things of God. We all, listen, and we all are just like the chief priests in the Old Testament. We have access into the holiest of all with God himself. Why? Because we're under a new and a better covenant. Jesus, his blood has already gone in. We don't have to come back up. And remember, remember when the high priest went in, he had to go in with the blood for himself and for the sins of the people. We we're already covered. And on the mercy seat of God is the blood of Jesus. We just walk right in and there it is. We're already covered. Thank God for the new and the better covenant. Thank God that we don't have to, we don't have to wonder or worry if we walk into his presence if we're going to get struck dead or not. He didn't have to raise a scepter or put a scepter down. Jesus is already there. Are you here? We can walk in and he says, there, there's one of our children, the blood. <laughs> My blood bought, bought and paid their price. Glory to God. My blood has made a way for them to enter into the Holy of Holies. My blood has given them a new covenant. Glory to God. I fulfilled all that the law demanded, and I shed my blood. And now they come based on the relationship with me before your presence, Father. It's a better covenant. Aren't you glad that if you mess up this week, you don't have to get on a jet and fly to Jerusalem and find the high priest and go get your offering and have him take it in for you? How many are glad? There'd be a lot of bankrupt Christians. Yeah. Flying to Jerusalem. Some folks would be flying to Jerusalem every other day. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Amen. Then we got a new covenant. We got a better covenant. Hallelujah. What? Through his blood. His blood has purchased this new covenant for us. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then last, we're going to close up right here because we're, we're, this was getting down to the end of this one. Victory in his blood. Church, I want you to know that you are called to live in victory. Yeah. Well, I just don't know why bad things happen to me. God does bad stuff to me to teach me a lesson. I don't know what he's trying to teach me, but he's putting stuff on me because he's trying to teach me a lesson. Hogwash! God's not trying to teach you anything. Yeah. Through cancer, through calamity, through your kids getting hurt, through all kinds of bad stuff. God's not doing that. That's not God. 
I said, that's not God. Revelation 12, 11 says they overcame him. That's talking about the devil. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Notice they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. You made a way where there was no way. Your blood opened the door. Hallelujah. Your blood made it so we could get in and to the place of victory. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? <clears throat> and the word of our testimony. See, we start saying, y'all hear? We start saying what God says. Now here, how many, how many of you ever been to an old Pentecostal-style testimony meeting? Mm -hmm. Now, it typically would go something along these lines. I want to thank the Lord that I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. That's about, that's about it. They sit down, the next person gets up, oh, I just want to thank the Lord that I'm saved, and sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. And somebody got really bad. They get up, oh, I want to thank the Lord that I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, the devil's been after me for a whole week. Oh, just, just, just pray for me that I can make it to the end. No, there's no victory in any of that. What they said is, I know I'm going to get to heaven eventually if I hold true to the end. And I need for y'all to pray for me because I don't know if I'm going to be able to hold true to the end. Yeah. I want to. But I'm telling you, it's been a hard old way. It's a tough life down here. Don't get me singing that song. I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain. I think, I think Candy Staten. It's a highway to heaven. I mean, let's get on the highway, man. Get off the rough side. Dear Lord. Amen. Let's get on the highway. Jesus. But you think there's no victory. There's the hope of victory. There's the wish of victory. And if enough people pray for me and hope that I'll hold truth, I'll make it in by the skin of my teeth. Somehow, some way, even by a hook or crook. But the Bible says they overcame. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. He's made us more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now, thanks, Paul, the Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians, I believe it is, chapter 15, around verse 57, says, Now, thanks be unto God, which always, he didn't say sometimes, always causes us to triumph through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, we need to have victory talk. Why? Because we've overcome by the blood. I said we've overcome by the blood and the word of our testimony. We need to start talking about what the blood's done. Hallelujah. We need to have a song of victory. Can you say amen? I'm telling you, you know, it says whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. We just got the, the last part. The first part says whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. How many have been born of God? Are you born again? Is Jesus your Lord? Then you're born of God. And if you're born of God, and, whatsoever, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. If you're born of God, you overcome. That's victory talk. That's talk that comes because Jesus' blood has purchased you and brought you out and established you, glory to God. And all you got to do is hook up your mouth with what he's done and get the victory. Yeah. Instead of talking defeat all the time. Uh -huh. right. Whining all the time. There's not enough cheese to go with all the wine in the church. Hello? It's true. I ain't talking about alcohol. I'm talking about whining, but you know, it would sound good. <laughs> Except for you, somebody get whining and complaining. You want a little cheese to go with that wine? Uh -huh. People all the time, whine. We should, the church should be the victory church. Right. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus. Yeah, but you know, the world's got this, and the world's got that, the world's got this. Don't forget, if you ain't got Jesus, you ain't got nothing. I said, if you ain't got Jesus, you ain't got nothing. Because anything you, let me say, if you brought, nothing, you brought nothing in this world, you ain't taking nothing out. You can get a $60 million house, and when the, when the rapture takes place, you don't get to take it with you. Hello? You can have a, 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 a house on the, on, on the Champs-Élysées in Paris, and look out your window of the street down there, the, the Arc de Triomphe, and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Or you can have one on the, the, uh, the, the French Riviera, and you can, have a, you can have a castle in Germany, and you can have a, a beach house at, you know, on some uh, uh, 
Figure Eight Island off the coast of North Carolina. You can have all that. You can have Lamborghinis and you can have Ferraris. You can have Rolls Royces. You can have Bentleys. You can have private jets. But I'm telling you, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. Amen. And you might not have any of that. But if you've got Jesus, you've got everything. Hallelujah. We need to get a mindset. You know, we preach prosperity in church to the point that even the church thinks, if I don't have this, if I don't have that, then I have nothing. Honey, if you've got Jesus, if you're born again, if the life of God's in you, you've got everything. Hallelujah. I'm not saying you shouldn't have things, but I'm telling you, we've got to have an adjustment of how we think. We got to stop thinking because I don't have a certain car. I'm not going to have happiness in life. I want you to know that your name is in the Lamb's book of life. It's not going to get blotted out. Glory to God. That when Jesus comes back, you'll be changed in the moment. In the twinkling of an eye, just a corruptible foot on the incorruptible, and you'll meet the Lord in the air. And so shall you ever be with Him. You ought to be shouting and rejoicing and running and glorifying God. Hallelujah. You get out of bed and say, glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus is my Lord. I got it all. Hallelujah. My God. I didn't get my beamer this week. I can't live. I don't have a beamer. Yeah, my God. That car ain't going to heaven. I want you to know that God's got stuff in heaven that I'll do your Beamer. I'll do your Mercedes. I'll do your Bentley. He's got chariots of fire, glory to God. They travel at light speed. You don't have a log cabin over in the corner of heaven. Jesus said, my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. Now, you don't need to be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. But you don't need to be so earthly minded you're no heavenly good. Hallelujah. We've got to realize once and again that the day you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you became a child of God, an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And the joy that you have. Hallelujah. What did, what did Paul write to the church of Colossae? He says, set not your affections on things on the earth, but on things above. We've got to get our affections back on heavenly things. The things of the earth will never provide the joy you're looking for. They don't have the power to do it. So tomorrow morning when you get up and you start, and the devil comes telling you what you don't have, just get up and start dancing. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. Hallelujah. I got Jesus. That's all I got to say. I got Jesus. I got Jesus. That's all I need. Glory to God. Hallelujah. There should be at least four folk dancing with me. Come on, man. Yes. I preached in the church one time. This little old man stood there. He got out on the end of the aisle. He just stood there the whole time. He was so old, he couldn't let go of the side. But he was dancing. That was his dance for the whole hour. And behind him was a lady with a hanky. She'd hank, and I'd preach. She'd hank some more, and I'd preach some more. Hallelujah. But I want you to know today, we have victory in the blood. Hallelujah. <coughs> you stop looking for vindication. You stop looking for this. You stop looking for that. And just get your eyes back on the Lord. He's got what you need. He'll put you over the top. <coughs> so much preaching about prosperity got out of balance. 
because everybody wanted to have, what was it, Robert Leach or whatever his name was, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Oh, yes, so-and-so from Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. And everybody wanted to be on the show with their yacht. Cheerio, jolly good. Baby, there are people with yachts who are going to hell. There are people with Bentleys going to hell. There are people with private jets going to hell. Bill Gates publicly said that he just doesn't need God. He's worth 80 some billion dollars and he don't need God. And, I, and, I, and I, it makes you weak for him because none of that 86 billion will leave here with him. It'll be burned up. All this Microsoft technology doesn't even compare to the one created. Think of what God created. We are told that we only use 10% of our brain. The biggest computer in the world is no match for the human brain. It can't process at the speed we process. And we're only using 10% of our capacity. The technologies of the world are nothing in comparison to the things of God. People mock God because they have money, they have goods, they have possessions. People mock God, anger with God because they don't have any money or possessions. But I'm telling you, victory in life is found through the blood of Jesus and the testimony that my God is my supply. My God is my support. My God causes me. What's 1 Corinthians 15, 57? But thanks be to God which, who always calls this. Always calls this. Not part-time. And don't look like it. Stop looking. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal. That word means subject to change. But the things which are not seen are eternal. What's eternal? The victory granted to us through Jesus Christ and his blood. What's temporal? That circumstance you're standing in. That pile of debt you're in. That pile of, of, of calamity going on around you. All that junk that's taking place trying to put you under. It's subject to change. Through the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Can everybody say hallelujah? So we thank God for the blood. I said we thank God for the blood. Hallelujah. We honor the Lord for the blood. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this service. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the word of God. Amen. We thank you for all the goodness of God. And Lord, we just come right now before you and just ask you to be perfect to be anyone with us this morning that's not born again. Jesus is not their Lord. They don't know him. They don't have him in their heart. You've dealt with them and made them realize that they need you. They need, they need Jesus. They need to be washed in the blood. Though your sins be red as crimson, be made white as snow. Hallelujah. There's a spiritual reaction. They have chemical actions in the natural. We have a spiritual reaction in the spirit. When the blood of Jesus comes in contact with the nature of sin, it's annihilated. Hallelujah. There's a spiritual reaction that takes a man lost without God, without hope in this world, and calls him to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. The pass from death unto life. If you're here this morning, you're not born again. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. I want to minister to you. Bring you into the kingdom of God through a simple prayer, believing in your heart. Amen? Anybody? All right, you say, Pastor Ed, I'm born again. I, I got saved. You know, I've been out like, just like that prodigal son, out living on the pig slop of the world. Came to myself this morning and found out that the corn husk and the slop just ain't no good. And I'm tired of eating it, and I want to get right with God. Is that you this morning? Raise your hand. Anybody? Anybody? One more offer here this morning before we close. Here this morning, you're born again, love God. Jack and Matt received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. What do you mean by that? They were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You love the Lord, you haven't received the Holy Spirit in that measure. See, when you get born again, you have the witness of the Spirit, but you're not filled with the Spirit. We don't have time to go through all the Scriptures to prove it. There's a bunch. Anybody here not filled with the Holy Ghost? Want to be filled? All right. Let's all stand up. Now, next Sunday, we forgot to announce this. Next Sunday night is Healing Rally. 
Next Sunday night's healing rally. So we'll be ministering on the subject of heal, faith or faith in healing, faith for healing. We'll be laying hands on the sick. If you have friends, relatives, uh, people you know that need prayer cloths, bring those to the service. Bring handkerchiefs to the service. We'll, pray, we'll lay hands on pray over those that you take them and go send them to them. We have had, you can, I'm telling you, some of the biggest miracles we've ever had out of this church is from prayer cloths. As a matter of fact, the most notable miracles that have taken place in, out of my ministry have come from prayer calls rather than from actually laying hands on the person in, in person. We've had testimonies and testimonies and testimonies over the years. Hallelujah. I think one number of years ago, the nephew that, that was in Duke Hospital of David's. Remember him? He was growing, that weird thing growing backwards or something. David came, brought the prayer cloth. Two weeks later, it turned around. Yeah. He's what? He's a big boy now. Hallelujah. See, yeah, they're, they're, you all know, know about that disease where the, all of a sudden the gene, the, something happens in the genes and they kick in and, and they reverse growth. They start going backwards. Now, Duke, Duke diagnosed this. Not some fly by heel. Duke. Prayer cloth. Two weeks later, turned around and he's a big boy. Why? Because there's, because there's power in the anointing of God. It's the yoke destroying, burden removing power of God. And we've had people get cancer. We've had tuberculosis. We've had all kinds of diseases healed. So bring prayer claws. If you can't get the people here, bring the prayer claws. We'll, we'll pray over them. Send them to them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I had one woman a number of years ago when I was an assistant pastor in Greenville. Um, they brought me, they, they couldn't get the, the cloth in because, you know, these, these lunatic hospitals won't let you bring prayer claws in a lot of times. So we sent candy. They got delivered. Another woman had tuberculosis. We sent a prayer cloth to her. And uh, she got healed. Came, I saw people a few months later. Oh, yeah, she's totally healed. Tuberculosis. The power of God. Yeah, Next Sunday night is healing rally. Bring the sick. Bring your prayer cloths. We're going to believe God for miracles, signs, and wonders. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We trust in the miracle God. Amen. Somebody say glory. glory. Hallelujah. Lord, bless the people. Let the, the revelation of the knowledge of the power of the blood settle on them. Let them walk in all that truth and all that revelation in Jesus' name. Amen.